Hello and welcome back to Dukascopy TV. Today I'm joined in the studio by Christopher Finger, member of the Applied Research Team at MSCI, to discuss over-the-counter derivatives under central clearing. So Christopher, first of all, what markets are we discussing and what is the motivation behind the change to how they work? Okay, thanks. Um, we're going to talk today about uh, over-the-counter derivatives. Um, and so in the whole space of derivatives, of course, there are a lot of derivatives in, in equities and commodities. Um, these are all typically traded for the most part on exchanges and, and really haven't been at the heart of the issue. So mostly we're talking about derivatives in, in interest rates um, and to some extent in credit and in foreign exchange. And what makes all of these important in this context is that the bulk of them trade um, as bilateral contracts. So I agree to make payments to you under certain situations, you agree to pay make payments to me under certain situations um, and we're not dealing with a, a central party at all. Um, and so the risk in that is that one of us uh, may not do what we're supposed to do under those contracts. And so if we look back at the events of, of 2008, certainly we had very large um, players uh, in this market and the fear that the default of one of these by sort of by virtue of the web of all the relationships um, with these bilateral contracts, the default of one of these could cause a systemic um, type of, of distress and not just a distress to its immediate trading partners. And how will these markets function under central clearing? Okay, so central clearing was uh, sort of proposed as a, a kind of a solution for this and, and certainly by the G20 just after the financial crisis um, mandated that to the extent possible derivatives should move to central clearing by, by the end of 2012, so, so this year. What this means is that rather than these derivatives ultimately trading as just contracts between two parties, that eventually all of these go through one central entity. So instead of you and I having a contract where you agree to pay me in one currency, I pay you in another, um, both of us go to a central party um, and take our sides of the trade to them. So we ultimately have each the same economic exposure. I'm still paying one currency, you're still paying the one that you contracted for. But we both face a central counterparty as the, as the entity um, on the back of that trade. So now I, don't, I no longer have an exposure in theory to your default, you no longer have an exposure. Um, to my default. And so, of course, all this only works if, in fact, the central party is itself safe, right? So uh, I think at first blush, we've concentrated risks um, more than we've solved them. Um, but the idea now is that we can focus on keeping these central counterparties um, essentially remote from a bankruptcy or a default event. So what there needs to be is a mechanism for that central counterparty to uh, immunize, in a sense, the rest of the market um, from a default by me or a default by you. So a default by me shouldn't impact you and, and vice versa. Um, and for this we need the central counterparty to have um, what in a lot of circles we're referred to as lines of defense. Um, so the central counterparty needs to be able to take over in the event that I default, say, on my contracts. Um, and so what they'll do is they'll, they'll take over that obligation. Um, and as soon as they can, they'll try to either sell that to somebody else in the market um, or otherwise offset that, that exposure. Um, and so what they need to sort of make that uh, less risky to them um, starts out with uh, what's referred to as variation margin, our mark to market. So that is, as each of us trade with the central counterparty, even if our trades are, are long dated, um, we will mark those to market every day and we will in a sense settle up with that central counterparty. So this is not unlike the way futures work. Um, for instance. So that uh, assures that the central counterparty is immune from or can, can handle a default immediately. If, if they were able to take over my obligations and immediately sell them, they could do that without a loss using my margin account uh, to cover. Um, now the reality of the situation is that uh, a, in the event of my default, again, um, the central counterparty would not necessarily be able to sell that immediately. Um, and so they need to be buffered in a sense for the amount the market could move um, in the time it takes them to, to offset this position. Um, and so that buffer that they will require of me or of you um, is referred to as a risk margin um, or also as an initial margin. And again, this is a buffer to sort of uh, account for the fact that the market might move a bit or a lot. 
um, in the uh, sort of days or weeks that it might take to offset this transaction. Um, and then finally, the last line of defense that the central counterparties have is some type of guarantee or default fund, which each member um, of this central counterparty would contribute to. And to the extent that a, a default occurred um, and these various margin accounts were not sufficient to cover the central counterparty, um, we would go to this default fund, um, and this is sort of what folks would refer to as mutualizing losses. So to some extent, we're all in it together, and if the margins are exhausted, then this default fund is, is used um, to protect the central counterparty. And what new risk management challenges will it present? So for, for people trading derivatives, um, and this would be either banks who are, who are clearing directly with the central counterparty or their clients, so asset managers, hedge funds, smaller banks um, who would be doing their clearing through those member banks. Um, all of these guys face, in a sense, a new type of risk. So if we, we think about moving from the bilateral world where other than the economics, the currencies or rates or what have you that, that we're, we're taking exposure to, uh, the primary risk is credit, right? Is my counterparty gonna, gonna make good um, on their side of the trade? We're moving from that into one where we think we've taken the credit part out of the equation, if, if all these mechanisms work, um, but the price for that uh, is, is a constraint on liquidity. Um, so all of these, in particular the margins that are required, uh, represent a cash need that anybody trading derivatives is going to have to look to. So the, the mark to market is going to vary every day. I need cash on hand to be able to cover that. And this risk margin, this buffer, is also going to, um, to change every day. And so I need to think about um, the, the implication of, of uh, that requirement as far as my liquidity and my cash needs. Um, and so, you know, as we move into this, I think there are, there are a set of, of fairly new questions to ask um, for people operating in these markets. Um, first of all, just what is this thing? What is this margin? Um, and the, to the degree that central counterparties demand some margin, um, it, it, can I make a sanity check on that? Do I understand how they're coming up with this number? Um, and uh, sort of how it might change if, if the markets move, et cetera. Um, I also might look for uh, efficient ways to, to transact with particular derivatives. That is, um, as it's played out, there aren't just, there's not just one central counterparty. There are a variety of different entities providing services in different types of derivatives. Um, and an important distinction between those is the degree to which they allow for so-called cross-margining. And so that would be um, the ability for me to offset my margin requirements in one product I'm trading with one and another. So I might be trading derivatives and futures with the same uh, counterparty, and to the extent that those offset each other, I might get a break on the liquidity need that I have. So I might be looking for opportunities to sort of most efficiently place a trade um, as that goes by. Um, and then of course looking at, once I put on a trade, how might my liquidity needs, my, my margin needs, change over time um, given sort of my views on, on how volatile the markets might be and what direction they might go. And finally, can you tell me about CVA? Yeah, so CVA is, is a topic that comes up a lot in this context um, in, in bilateral derivatives in particular. Um, so it stands for Credit Valuation Adjustment. Um, and it's been uh, a mechanism that banks have now used uh, going back, say, to the late 90s um, to essentially account for the fact that when they do derivatives with a, with a sort of bilateral counterparty, there is a possibility um, that the promised payments won't get made. Um, and so the idea is to account for that in the way those derivatives are valued. So I'm going to knock off a little bit when I, when I value a derivative uh, to account for the fact that you may not pay me um, what you're supposed to um, under, a uh, under a given contract. Um, and so that was very relevant certainly in the bilateral case where credit again was the, the, the primary risk other than sort of the, the finance and economics of the derivatives themselves. Um, and so as we move into sort of the central counterparty world arguably CVA becomes a little less important in this context, a again, because we, we think we've dealt with um, the credit e element of things. Um, but what now becomes, again, sort of the constraining factor or the additional risk is this need for liquidity. And so what I certainly see is, is uh, more analysis of the cash needs to support a transaction or set of transactions um, you know, as, they, as they evolve. 
um, and to some extent thinking about that in the valuation is this need for cash and, and liquidity that's there. Thank you, Christopher. All right, thank you. And thank you very much for watching Dukascopy TV. Do stay tuned for more exclusive interviews from the Dukascopy TV team. But for now, have a good weekend.